This tumor has caused quite a bit of confusion over the past uh, ne nearly 50 years or so since it was first described. This is a dermal nerve sheath myxoma. And the reason that it's been so difficult and controversial is because there's another tumor with um, a name, uh, neurothechioma, and sometimes the name neurothechioma has been applied to this lesion we're looking at here, and sometimes it's been applied to other lesions, uh, such as cellular neurothechioma, which we'll look at in a minute. So because of the confusion in naming, I find that uh, this entity and cellular neurothechioma often cause a lot of grief for pathology trainees, and even sometimes practicing pathologists because the name, uh, the name differences have been so confusing in the literature over the decades. So I use the term dermal nerve sheath myxoma for this tumor here, and I think that that's probably the best thing to do. I think most, uh, most uh, dermatopathologists and soft tissue pathologists probably agree on that now. And uh, in the um, video description below, I'll list uh, some references that you can use for further reading on this entity. There's a really great paper by uh, Fetch and Laskin and Mietnen, which is uh, really, I think, uh, one of the greatest papers to read on this entity. But let me tell you about dermal nerve sheath myxoma. It's usually in the dermis and sometimes extends down further into the subcutis, and it has these uh, very striking multinodularity with these myxoid nodules that are divided by fibrous septa. And so you can see there's numerous nodules here. And this is just one of, of several um, sections of this tumor. You can see each of the pieces is very multinodular, very pale blue myxoid in the center, and uh, very hypocellular too. So that from low power makes this tumor very distinct. You could think about other things like cutaneous myxoma, also known as superficial angiomyxoma. You could, you could think of uh, a variety of other things, but, but not too many because this, this multinodularity is really striking. And once you notice it's myxoid, hypocellular, and has this uh, multilobularity with the fiber septa in between, uh, the very first thing that comes to my mind is gonna be a dermal nerve sheath myxoma. And again, in the past, these were often called the myxoid variant of neurothechioma or conventional neurothechioma, but uh, I uh, urge you to not use those names because it causes a lot of confusion with cellular neurothechioma, which is totally unrelated. So let's take a closer look here. Let me find a good uh, lobule here, this is nice. When we go down into the center of these uh, lobules, what you can see is that there are kind of plump, almost epithelioid cells here, and they're suspended in a myxoid background, and the cells have this tendency to kind of uh, clump together. So you'll see like, uh, I think we can get a little closer here. See there are kind of multi multiple nuclei that are kind of sticking together, making almost like little cords or chains. And those little cords and chains are suspended in this blue uh, myxoid or mucinous looking background. And that's the real characteristic feature of dermal nerve sheath myxoma. And sometimes the cells are, are, are very round and, and epithelioid like here. And other times they're more thin and spindly looking. And I find that this kind of uh, arrangement in cords and chains suspended in the, the myxoid stroma to be uh, very useful um, and helpful for the diagnosis. That would be unusual, say, for a um, regular cutaneous myxoma and uh, would be a pretty unusual pattern for most other things. So I think that these, uh, these kind of uh, cells make little chains and cords that kind of vaguely swirl around. Uh, let's see if we can appreciate that from a little bit lower power kind of vaguely swirl and follow each other around in this myxoid background. Sometimes the areas are a little more haphazard and uh, less organized into these cords and chains. The other feature that you'll occasionally see, and I think this case here is probably my favorite case in my whole collection because it shows this, is, oh, let's see if I can find it now. Ah, there it is. Look at that, that's nuclear palisading, just like you'd see in a schwannoma. And in fact, in the past, probably there are some things that have been reported as plexiform, myxoid, uh, schwannomas that are actually dermal nerve sheath myxoma. And the reason that you see this striking palisading here is because these actually are nerve sheath tumors. Dermal nerve sheath myxoma is a true nerve sheath tumor of Schwann cell origin and probably is more closely related to schwannoma than say to neurofibroma or other types of uh, nerve sheath tumor. And uh, this is evidenced by the fact that these tumors uh, are strongly positive for S100, SOX10, and they often express uh, GFAP, glial fibrillary acidic protein as well. 
So you can, if you see a tumor like this, this is almost, I mean, this is basically diagnostic on H&E, I think, when you see one of these. But if you want to support it, you can do S100 or SOX10, all right? Now, let me show you why part of the controversy exists uh, between this tumor, that dermal nerve sheath myxoma, and why some people thought that there might be a relationship between this and what we now call cellular neurothechioma. And the reason is that you have cases like this one, Look from low power, and I apologize, the slide's very scratched up. I have not taken good care of it. The cover slip's scratched. But looking from, uh, from low power here, you can again see it's kind of pale and mixoid. It's got nice multi-lobularity, and it's got fibrous bands or septa in between these lobules. So you could say, okay, I think this could be a, a nerve sheath myxoma. But then look what happens. In the center, you do have areas, uh, I guess you do have some areas like this, that are hypocellular and mixoid, but you also have areas like this that are a little bit more sheet-like and composed of larger cells that have a lot more cytoplasm and have, uh, to my eye at least, a kind of a histiocytic looking or histiocytoid appearance. And they usually have these kind of large oval to round nuclei that have very fine, delicate, pale chromatin, sometimes have little nucleoli and they have a good bit of a gray to pink cytoplasm. So when you see something that you think is a dermal nerve sheath myxoma with the myxoid, hypocellular, multiple lobules or nodules, and then you see areas like this that are kind of sheet-like and histiocytic, almost always if you add an S100 or a SOX10 to this tumor, it's going to be negative. So these tumors are actually cellular neurothechiomas. And again, the reason that got confused is that in the past, some people called the, the dermal nerve sheath myxoma, they called them uh, neurothechioma, and then when you saw things that looked kind of like that and had cellular uh, sheet-like areas, people began to suggest that these were actually cellular uh, neurothechiomas or cellular variants of the, the myxoid tumor I first showed you. And um, I think it's understandable to see how that happened. And I'm, all of this happened before I was even in medicine. Much of it happened actually before I was even born. So I may not be uh, as savvy about telling the history as uh, some of the people who maybe lived and practiced through it. But this is my understanding from looking backwards is that basically this is how the confusion kind of arose is that people were using the, the term neurothechioma uh, for tumors that looked like that first myxoid lesion I showed you. And then when you had ones that had cellular areas, people thought there was a relationship. And, um, and, and because of that, sometimes people will call these kind of hybrid uh, myxoid and cellular neurothechioma. Now, I just regard all of these lesions like the one I'm showing you right now as cellular neurothechioma. And again, the easiest way to tell them apart is to do an S100 or a SOX10. S100 and SOX10 are positive essentially always in dermal nerve sheath myxoma. That first tumor I showed, the tumor that used to be sometimes called the myxoid or conventional variant of neurothechioma, those are positive for S100 SOX10. So we call them dermal nerve sheath myxomas now. Tumors like this and the more cellular ones that I'm going to show you in a minute, they're negative for S100 and SOX10. So that basically excludes them from being a, ner a true nerve sheath tumor. So the name cellular neurothechioma is very confusing because it's not actually a neural tumor at all. They're negative for S100 SOX10 and uh, Schwann cell markers. So uh, uh, that's uh, that's uh, what causes a lot of problems is that these names get get used and are very confusing because one of them that has the name neuro in it is not actually even a nerve sheath tumor. So what are these tumors actually? Well, no one really knows. There's a lot of debate. I kind of think they're probably somewhere in the so-called fibrohistiocytic spectrum. They look kind of histiocytoid. They stain with some histiocytic markers. Uh, cellular neurothechiomas also stain with a variety of unusual markers that most people don't seem to have in their labs, such as uh, PGP9.5, NKIC3, a neuron specific enolase, which is a, a terribly non specific stain that stains lots of other things too, but it does tend to stain these. And also, uh, unusually, I told you that these are S100 and SOX10 negative, but they are actually often positive for a uh, a subtype of S100 called S100A6. So I think that for pathology residents, those are good things to remember for examination purposes and things like that. I, I imagine that those are testable items. I don't have any knowledge of that. I don't write any questions for the board exams. But I think that those are probably good things that I teach my residents to remember. But in real life, I've not uh, experienced, don't have very much experience with them. And from talking to other people who do, they've, in general, many people have told me that they've tried those markers and don't find them to be terribly uh, helpful in these. So I feel like these are tumors that once I've done an S100 or a SOX and excluded um, 
a, a true nerve sheath tumor and uh, excluded other possibilities, I feel like I'm pretty comfortable usually making this diagnosis on H&E alone. So again, this is a, one of these kind of mixed looking tumors. This is a cellular neurothechioma that has myxoid areas. And about a third of cellular neurothechiomas will have myxoid areas, again, which is part of why all this confusion has happened. All right, I'll show you another, um, another example now. Of, of really a classic example of cellular neurothechioma. This one doesn't have any, let's see if we can get a real low power. This one doesn't have any myxoid areas. What this has is again striking multinodularity, but you have these kind of nodules or large nests or balls of cells that are in the dermis and they're again divided by dense uh, collagen or kind of sclerotic backgrounds. And if you look closer, uh, these cells really have either you could either say they look kind of histiocytoid and, and sometimes they remind me a little bit of like large granulomas almost, or you could say that they look kind of uh, melanocytic, that they remind you of spitzoid cells, uh, like from a spitz nevus. And I think that's the biggest, uh, the biggest risk with these tumors, and I apologize this slide's a little faded, but I think it's still a really good example, so that's why I'm showing it. I think definitely that these tumors, uh, when they're kind of these uh, large epithelioid cells with pale cytoplasm um, and they're making nests in the dermis, it's real easy to see how this could get confused with a melanocytic tumor, particularly a spitzoid, um, a spitzoid lesion. And the problem with that is that cellular neurothechiomas sometimes have pretty prominent nuclear atypia. They often have mitoses. The average uh, mitotic rate is about three per 10 high power fields and sometimes can be a fair bit higher than that. They can even occasionally have atypical mitoses. So if you think that this is a spitzoid uh, melanocytic lesion and haven't done any stains and then you start finding mitoses, that's really scary. So my advice usually is that if you think you have something that might be spitzoid and is atypical or has mitoses and you're debating, oh, is this a atypical spitzoid neoplasm, spitzoid melanoma, that whole debate, which is a totally uh, different topic for a different time. If you think you might have something that's an atypical spitzoid lesion and it's totally in the dermis, um, do an S100 or a SOX10. If it's negative, it's very unlikely to truly be a spitzoid melanocytic neoplasm, and it may very well be a cellular neurothechioma. And the reason that distinction is important is that mitotic activity and atypia in melanocytic lesions obviously is often concerning. But in cellular neurothechiomas, at least from the work that Jason Hornick and Chris Fletcher have done, they've published some great papers on this topic. The, um, when you find atypia, even atypical mitotic figures, uh, increased mitotic rate, all of those things in cellular neurothechioma do not seem to pretend a, a, a poor prognosis or aggressive behavior. They're just a, a histologic curiosity. There are certainly a few, I'll show you in a minute, that can, can be quite scary appearing, but they usually, as far as we know, seem to behave well. So again, the, the features of cellular neurothechioma is that you have these balls or nodules or nests of cells. They're uh, plump, round, epithelioid, kind of histiocytoid. They usually have this nice, delicate uh, chromatin that's kind of open and pale chromatin that you can almost see, like you can imagine, you can almost look through the nucleus a little bit because they're so pale. And um, sometimes uh, kind of uh, central punctate nucleoli. Let me show you the other piece on this slide. Here, some of the, the nests are quite large over here. And again, it's just striking multinodularity with real nice fibrous uh, septa in between subdividing each of the nests. And uh, there, note, there is nothing in the epidermis. Uh, to me, at least my understanding and my concept of this tumor is that they do not involve the epidermis. If you have stuff that's in the epidermis and the dermis, it is essentially not a cellular neurothechioma. I've never seen a case that had anything involving the epidermis. So if you have something like that, it may be melanocytic or something else. So let's look again closer at these, uh, these nests here of cells. And look, there's a mitosis, I told you. See, we found a mitosis, kind of a large prophase mitosis, but again, and some of the cells are large, but look, they have the real pale, nice chromatin. These are the, the beautiful example of uh, the cells of a cellular neurothechioma. Okay, so now we've looked at the myxoid. Let's review here, Let's. this is the Dermal nerve sheath myxoma is what we call this tumor now. It used to be called conventional neurothechioma or myxoid neurothechioma. I, I recommend avoiding using those names for this. Call this dermal nerve sheath myxoma. And then tumors like this are cellular neurothechioma. Totally unrelated and totally not a nerve sheath tumor. They will be negative for SOX10 and negative for S100, okay? 
So let's look at a few other examples now and see if we can sort out which one is the nerve sheath myxoma and which one is a cellular nerve ethioma. So this should be obvious right away. I think this is a beautiful example of dermal nerve sheath myxoma. And it looks, it looks almost like the same case I just showed you, but it's actually not. It's from a different patient. Um, these tumors, uh, dermal nerve sheath myxomas, have a strong predilection for the distal extremities, particularly the hand and the fingers, okay? So the majority of them will be on the hand or finger. And they have, even though they're totally benign, they do have a significant tendency for local recurrence, particularly if they're incompletely excised. Now, when they recur, they are not aggressive, but they can sometimes recur three or even, even more times, two, three, four, five times have been reported before. So they can be multiply recurrent, but when they recur, they're not destructive or aggressive recurrences. So I think it's okay to uh, watch and wait. And I find that many soft tissue tumors, even the benign ones that are located on the hands or on the fingers, have a higher tendency for local recurrence. And I think that part of that is the fact that you just have such a small amount of tissue there, and that when a hand surgeon uh, goes in to take out one of these nodules, they really try to remove as little extra normal tissue as possible. So there's a tendency for these tumors to be um, kind of uh, tangled up in you know the background uh, tissue that's left behind maybe even the tendon or things there because the skin and, and all the soft tissue structures are so close together so I think it's understandable that you have a higher recurrence rate for tumors in the hands and the fingers I feel like a lot of benign soft tissue tumors in acral locations have that issue so again we have a multi nodularity nice fibrous septa in between each nodule at higher power you can see that the cells are um, these bland little spindled or, or sometimes round um, or epithelioid Schwann cells that are either clustered together or running in little cords or chains or making little kind of spindly wisps that follow each other. See how they kind of are arranged in long lines and they run through the background, the myxoid background. So it's a really beautiful tumor. Mitoses, unlike cellular neurothechioma, which often has mitoses, these usually do not have mitoses or have very few mitoses. Um, so I think that it's the hypocellularity and the, the prominent myxoid background and the fact that they're making these cords and chains, the low mitotic rate, those are all features that support the diagnosis of, of a uh, dermal nerve sheath myxoma, which is what this one is. So again, from low power, dermal nerve sheath myxoma. Beautiful classic example. Let's turn it the right way up. So here we've got a tumor in the dermis. It's got multiple nodules divided by fibrous uh, kind of sclerotic uh, septa or uh, bands of fibrosis in the background there you can see real nicely. We don't really have any myxoid areas in this one and the cells are these kind of epithelioid histiocytoid looking cells with pale kind of chromatin. You can already see there's some mitotic activity. So this is cellular neurothechioma. This is S100 negative, SOX10 negative. And this uh, particular case right here shows another feature that you see in a, in a subset of cellular neurothechiomas and that's uh, multinucleated giant cells, kind of little osteoclastic looking multinucleated giant cells are often present about, I think it's about 15% if I recall correctly, of cellular neurothechiomas will have multinucleated osteoclastic giant cells scattered in them. So that's a useful clue um, to the diagnosis when you see that the multinucleated cells. And again, these are these kind of histiocytoid cells that are making up the uh, multiple nodules that we're seeing here. And you can sometimes have cellular sheet-like areas. You can definitely have infiltrative growth at the edges of cellular neurothechioma. Totally okay to see those things. Does not intent, it does not uh, signify a more aggressive behavior or anything like that. And these tumors, uh, cellular neurothechioma, tend to be in uh, children or young adults, have uh, somewhat of a higher tendency in women. And uh, as opposed to dermal nerve sheath myxoma, which occurs largely on the hands and the fingers, cellular neurothechioma occurs usually on the upper extremities, the shoulder uh, region, and also the head and neck. So the majority of cases there are gonna be in the head and neck or upper upper uh, extremity, the uh, proximal upper extremities of, of uh, oftentimes children, adolescents, young adults uh, with a, pre a female predilection. And again, you can see that it gets close to the epidermis and there are some background melanocytes over top over here, but these are not related to the tumor. These are the tumor cells and they're just in the dermis. 
And I think on this piece here, you can definitely see that if you just had a shave biopsy of that, you could easily mistake this for a melanocytic neoplasm. But again, it's going to be SOX10 and S100 negative. Okay, let's look at another case. So here's a, here's a nodule. It uh, looks like it's probably in the deep dermis of the subcutis. We can tell that whenever we have a nodule without uh, much surrounding it or without any epidermis over it, usually that means it's going to be in the, the subcutis. And you can see here it looks uh, pale blue and myxoid. So your first inclination uh, might be that to think that this is a dermal nerve sheath myxoma. But probably as you're already um, noticing, there are also zones that are more sheet-like and cellular made of more round cells, like so. And when we look closer on those areas, we can see that these are kind of round, plump, histiocytoid or almost epithelioid looking cells, really pale chromatin again. So once we see these sheet-like areas, we know that this is not going to be a dermal nerve sheath myxoma. This is going to be a cellular neurothechioma, which is what this is. So this is a cellular neurothechioma with uh, these large epithelioid or histiocytoid looking cells and that has background areas that are very pale, blue, hypocellular myxoid. And again, in the past, some people would call things like this a mixed type um, a neurothechioma, suggesting that it had a relationship between dermal nerve sheath myxoma and a hybrid between that and cellular neurothechioma. But now I regard all of these just as cellular neurothechioma. Whether they have a bunch of myxoid area or no myxoid area, I just call all of them cellular neurothechioma. And in fact, I think when I have a cellular sheet-like areas in a tumor and I start seeing multinodularity, um, if I find myxoid areas in the background, I feel that's a useful diagnostic clue to help me make the diagnosis of cellular neurothechioma because I know that about 30% or so of cellular neurothechiomas will have uh, myxoid zones just like this. So that's what I call these. This is a, this is a nice example of a cellular neurothechioma. And sometimes, again, it's more sheet-like like this, and the multinodularity isn't quite as apparent at first. But if you look to the edges, often you'll start to see that these cellular zones break up into little, little nodules or little, little collections or round aggregates of cells. So it's not quite as striking as those earlier cases I showed you. But you can still appreciate a multinodularity here. And I think that that's helpful for making the diagnosis. And I do find that oftentimes this one is a little harder because it's kind of fragmented and you don't really have any normal tissue at the edges. But I've definitely seen some large sheet-like ones like this that out to the periphery, there were really nice, tight little balls or nests or aggregates of cells, just like the cellular neurothechiomas I showed you earlier in the dermis. And so I think that when I, when I go to the edges, sometimes I'll find areas like that. And we just don't really see it here because all we have is uh, the... the the tumor mass itself and uh, don't really have any surrounding normal tissue. All right, so here we've got a kind of a wedge or a, a large punch of skin and you can see there's a tumor facing the dermis. The multinodularity is apparent even from low power and each of the nodules is composed of epithelioid or histiocytoid cells with a lot of pale cytoplasm, round to oval nuclei, and there's dense bands of sclerosis running between each of these nodules. So again, this is a nice example of cellular neurothechioma. And you can see how on a superficial biopsy, this could be really difficult to uh, tell apart from, say, a melanocytic lesion or, or something else. And, you know, the problem is that, uh, again, like I said, you can do S100 and SOX10, which will be negative in cellular neurothechioma, but uh, all of the other markers are either not widely available and or not very specific for the diagnosis. I, I honestly don't think there's any real one specific marker, and there's not any real uh, molecular finding that we have yet that, uh, that will help us make the diagnosis with certainty. So because of that, I think sometimes, or some people view cellular neurothechioma as kind of a mixed bag and maybe this is a heterogeneous kind of wastebasket term. I really do think that, especially from the ones I've shown you here, the, there really are striking histologic features that help you, I think, to make the diagnosis. But I definitely do also feel that sometimes other tumors probably are getting lumped in this category um, that are other forms of histiocytic tumors or fibrohistiocytic tumors that are not easily classifiable. I think sometimes those might get um, put under the rubric of cellular neurothechioma when maybe, in fact, they're not actually the same thing. So hopefully in time we'll have better um, 
molecular information about these uh, tumors to help us sort them out more clearly. In, in any event, uh, we know that they, they do uh, behave in a benign uh, manner. So, so once you recognize the pattern and have ruled out other things like melanocytic lesions, uh, you know that at least the, the behavior is going to be good for tumors like this, it seems. Uh, when they do have a lot of atypia, I still kind of like them to be uh, at least conservatively excised to get negative margins if possible, if that's clinically feasible. In regular kind of routine cases like this, I don't think that re-excision is necessary. Um, recurrence is actually pretty uh, low risk of recurrence in these tumors unlike dermal nerve sheath myxoma, which recur probably around half the time or so. So let me show you some of the more atypical examples of uh, cellular neurothechioma. So here again, you can see we've got a, a large excision here and a, a large uh, dermal uh, process that is made of multiple uh, nodules that are sharply um, circumscribed and divided by sclerotic or fibrous bands or septa in between. Some of these are kind of small nodules or nests and some are very large. Looking closer, I think it's easy to see the similarities between this tumor and say the last case I showed or that very first cellular neurothechioma I showed. You can see that the cells are have a lot of pale cytoplasm. They have oval to round nuclei and have again that real pale, almost clear looking nuclear chromatin. So I think that hopefully you can see that there's a lot of, a lot of similarity that, that would lead us to say that this is a cellular neurothechioma. But look, already you can see there's a mitosis, which I told you we can have those. But also this tumor not only has mitoses, it has some mitoses that are, are atypical, which that admittedly is uncommon. Only a small subset of cellular neurothechiomas have atypical mitoses, but it, is, it has been reported and it does not appear to correlate with aggressive behavior as far as we know. And you can see there are some multinucleated tumor giant cells here and that some of the tumor nuclei look a bit different than the other ones. They're starting to get really uh, kind of clumpy, a hyperchromatic chromatin. And as we look around here, I think we can find some cells that actually are, are relatively large and atypical. Like so, we're seeing some pretty significant pleomorphism here in the tumor. There's an atypical, I think it's an atypical mitosis there. Yeah, it's a mitosis. I thought maybe it was a pycnotic or karyorectic nucleus. It's like an X marks the spot mitosis. You know, normally when we see pleomorphism and atypical mitoses in a tumor, we say that that tumor is malignant and they're going to behave badly. But again, from the, from the study, the nice study that Hornick and Fletcher published that showed that atypical features, even significant atypia in cellular neurothechioma does not appear to uh, suggest aggressive behavior. Uh, it still makes you pretty scared and spooked when you see it. And I think the most important thing is make, again, making sure that what you're, that you're not dealing with some other tumor, that you're not dealing with a melanocytic tumor, in which case this kind of atypia here would basically make the tumor malignant in almost every uh, situation. Or that you're not dealing with some other unusual sarcoma, like say a mix of sarcoma or something like that. So I think that's the real important thing is making sure that you've really excluded the other possibilities before you call a tumor with this much atypia um, a, an atypical cellular neurothechioma. But I think here, uh, again, at high power, these are really scary looking. But when you go back to low power, I mean, the features here fit beautifully for cellular neurothechioma. These nice nodules of tumor cells that are divided by those thick bands of fibrosis or sclerosis. And again, there's going to be, um, again, we'll look at the, there's a, another atypical mitosis. So this is really on uh, the couple I'm going to show you here are on the very atypical end of the, of the atypical cellular neurothechiomas I've seen. And as far as I know, these patients have all had um, good outcomes, uh, even several years uh, down the road from their initial diagnosis and treatment. So that's a, that's a good sign when you see that. But uh, like I said, when I see this much atypia, I, even though I know that the data supports that these will behave in a benign fashion, I still feel that that this is, is an entity that is, is not totally uh, fully understood maybe and we're still uh, developing our ideas about it. And uh, when I see the ones with marked atypia like this, my personal view is that it's probably uh, best to do a conservative re-excision and follow the patient closely because these are rare and unusual tumors. And so I usually recommend that if it's clinically feasible to do. Um, and that's, uh, I don't know that that's a view that everyone holds, but that's my personal view and the personal way that I normally deal with cases uh, with this degree of cytologic atypia and mitotic uh, activity.
But again, looking at the edges, you can see real nice example of those, uh, those nice little nodules that are um, separated from each other and that's perfect for cellular neurothechioma. And this would be a very unusual growth pattern for say a, a soft tissue sarcoma of, of, or undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. It would be very unusual to have this striking multi-nodularity like this. And um, again, S100 and SOX10 would be totally negative in this tumor, uh, which would exclude the possibility essentially of a, of a melanocytic lesion. All right, so an atypical cellular neurothechioma. Now, here's another example. This one was deeper down. Let me clean the slide real quick. This was deeper down, and this is, I think, probably one of my favorite examples of, of atypical cellular neurothechioma that I've seen. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's very challenging, but I think it's also very convincing. So on one hand, you have the multinodularity and the hypocellular myxoid areas that really remind you of a dermal nerve sheath myxoma at first glance, right? And like I said, sometimes you see the, this myxoid area and that's part of what's caused all the confusion and name and terminology confusion in the past. Because then you see that these areas merge into areas like this that are, are multinodular and very cellular, and also areas that are large and sheet-like uh, sheets of cells. So this is a great example of both the hypocellular myxoid areas and the hypercellular uh, areas that you can see in cellular neurothechioma. This is a huge example, very large. And again, if you go closer, these areas really do resemble, in a, in a lot of ways, like if I just showed you some of, something like that, you could definitely start thinking, well, that, that really could be a dermal nerve sheath myxoma. But this tumor was negative for S100 and SOX10, so that excludes that possibility because essentially 100% of dermal nerve sheath myxomas will be S100 or SOX10 positive, basically by definition. They are nerve sheath tumors, Schwann cell origin. They should be positive. These are not nerve sheath tumors, not Schwann cell origin, and they should be S100 and SOX10 negative. And um, you can see, so we have the, the myxoid zones, and even in the myxoid zones, we're starting to get um, larger kind of histiocytoid cells like you'd see in a cellular neurothechioma. And we're also getting t multinucleated tumor giant cells, and we're already seeing lots of atypia. Um, and then when we go over here to the other part of the tumor, we again see those sheets of cells like I showed you in, in, in that kind of... Uh, a uh, myxoid looking cellular neurothechioma earlier. We're seeing again multinucleated giant cells. Very nice, very helpful feature, I think. The cells have that abundant pale cytoplasm and kind of merge with their neighbors. You can sometimes have kind of almost foamy looking areas in the lesion. I'm trying to find the more atypical uh, zones. I, th I think there's probably enough atypia here that you've seen, but. But yeah, I mean, these cells, again, are large and uh, some pleomorphism, multinucleated tumor giant cells, but still they have tend to have that kind of pale, uh, pale washed out looking nuclear chromatin, even though they do have pleomorphic cells scattered throughout. And um, this is another example of a cellular neurothechioma that just has a lot of atypia. And the main thing that I kind of wondered about here when I saw this case, it was some time ago, but I wondered about, um, you know, it's myxoid, it has atypia, it has mitosis. Could this be an unusual example of a myxofibrosarcoma? Well, myxofibrosarcoma is, I, I don't think I've ever seen one that's quite so strikingly multilobulated. Uh, and also myxofibrosarcs are almost always infiltrative at the edges. And you can see this is very sharply circumscribed at the edge. And most importantly, perhaps, is that this was from the wrist of a 16-year-old girl. And so the uh, mix of fibrosarcoma in a patient that young would be extremely, extremely unusual. I don't think, in fact, that I've ever seen a case in my experience in someone that young. I'm sure it's been reported, but I've never seen one yet. And uh, again, as far as I know, the, the follow-up has been fine. I think that I recommended them to do a conservative excision to make sure this was fully out and to follow the patient closely. And, um, and all went well. And the most helpful thing here is, again, I showed you all these features in the middle of the tumor that fit with cellular neurothechioma, like we talked about in all the other cases. But most, most helpful, and the reason I really love this case, is this tiny little focus down here. And remember how I mentioned that sometimes after, if you get to the real periphery where the interface between the tumor and the normal tissue is, if you get away from the big, huge sheet-like areas and the, the large nodules, sometimes you'll see little balls, little tiny nests, of what looks like classic, beautiful, perfect 
cellular neurothic gliom. I mean, that's like picture perfect right here. Look, each of these, each of these little world nodules of cells, that's exactly like the cellular neurothic gliom as I showed you uh, up in the dermis. And see, there's more of them right here. It's just perfect. Little histiocytoid cells making these little tight nests or balls and having this sclerotic stroma dividing them from one another. And that's perfect. So it was really reassuring and nice, I think, in this case to see all this kind of crazy stuff in the myxoid and cellular sheet like areas and then coming to the periphery and seeing these perfect little nests of textbook classic cellular neurothechioma, which really helps support the idea that this entire tumor is just a really big, really atypical looking, but totally benign cellular neurothechioma. So it's a really important tumor to know about because as you can see, it would be real easy, I think, to overdiagnose this as a malignancy when you have cytologic features like this and have mitoses and even atypical mitoses scattered around. Uh, those are features that are very scary and I think, uh, I think you do have to really use caution here again and make sure that really what you're dealing with is truly a cellular neurothechioma, at least that's my advice to myself. And uh, if I'm not sure, I'll, I'll sometimes say, well, it's an atypical uh, uh, you know, lesion that I favor to be a cellular neurothechioma, but I still want it to be excised to be sure. Uh, and it would be really nice if we had a specific marker uh, or some molecular that we could do to really prove it. But until we get that, uh, we're going to have to use H&E. And I think that H&E is always the most important thing, uh, regardless of what ancillary tests we have available. All right, one last case. It's down deep dermis or subcutis. Again, I didn't, didn't clean my slide well enough. Oh, and some of it's scratched. It's multinodular. You can see it's hypocellular and myxoid in these areas. So you could think about at first a dermal nerve sheath myxoma. I mean, that little nodule certainly could fit with dermal nerve sheath myxoma, but these areas over here are again, beginning to get those kind of more sheet-like aggregates of histiocytoid cells. Those histiocytoid cells are starting to make little nodules, little balls, little aggregates that are divided by fibrous uh, stroma. They have those uh, open chromatin, kind of pale, fine chromatin and oval to round nuclei. And of course, S100 and SOX10, as you probably can predict by now, was completely negative in this tumor. So even though it has areas that kind of have this long, thin chain-like uh, 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 or, or arrangement of cells in a hypocellular kind of myxoid background. It also has cellular areas. And again, even when it's myxoid and hypocellular in some areas, if it has any areas that are cellular, it's almost always going to be S100 and SOX10 negative, and therefore going to be a cellular uh, neurothechioma. So I hope that uh, going back and forth and showing all these different examples helps to uh, clarify the histologic features and also hopefully will help you sort out the uh, name uh, controversy and confusion that has existed for many years between dermal nerve sheath myxoma, which we no longer call conventional neurothechioma or myxoid neurothechioma, we just call it dermal nerve sheath myxoma, and these tumors, which are cellular neurothechioma, which in fact are not neural at all.